because I was pretty comfortable. I, I didn't have a lot of anxiety about just being in the OR. Yeah. Um, Cause it's like, Hey, a normal day at the office, except I happen to be on the table today. Welcome to another episode of Shared Experiences in Oncology and Rare Diseases, brought to you by My Tomorrows. I'm your host, Erin Moriarty Wade. I'm a communications and patient advocacy manager at My Tomorrows, and I'm also the mom of a child with a rare disease. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome a very special guest to the podcast. Dr. Beverly Zavaleta is a board certified family physician, a cancer survivor, and a longtime advocate of patient education. Dr. Zavaleta earned her medical degree from Harvard Medical School, and she practices as a hospitalist physician in South Texas. In 2015, she was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer and underwent a grueling chemotherapy regimen. She then decided to combine her personal and professional experience and write a book to help others facing cancer. Her book, Braving Chemo, gives patients and caregivers a clear and comforting handbook about chemotherapy. Dr. Zavaleta, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Very exciting. Thank you. So to get us started, can you tell us a little bit about uh, a little more about your professional background and your work as a physician in Texas? Yes, yeah, so I've been in Texas since uh, 2000. Uh, so 22 years. I came here originally to San Antonio first to do my residency training in family medicine. So um, I, I'm a family physician through and through, trained to take care of folks from uh, birth to death. And I, I love doing that. I spent the first 10 years of my career doing broad spectrum family medicine. I had a private practice with one partner after my training. And then um, I, I moved to South Texas. Uh, I actually live and work currently in Brownsville and I have my family here. Um, my uh, husband is from Brownsville. And um, so we live here now and I practice here as a hospitalist, which is taking care of hospitalized patients. And so I'm not doing outpatient primary care, but I like to say that general hospitalist physicians are the family physicians of the hospital. So um, for the general internal medicine physicians and family physicians who don't round on their patients in the hospital anymore, my group, my team, um, I'm part of a team that takes care of those patients when they need to be hospitalized or for folks who don't have uh, a doctor, we take care of them and while they're in the hospital and then send them on their way back to their primary care doctor to be seen. So um, I'm still doing general medicine, which I love. And so now that, uh, well, always that has included cancer patients. And as you described in, in that very nice introduction, um, I am a cancer survivor and uh, a lot of my work volunteer work in the last seven, eight years has been with the cancer community. And so I do get to take care of cancer patients in the hospital in a general medicine capacity and working with oncologists and dealing with um, the side effects of cancer treatments or the aftermath of cancer treatments. And so um, as my work, in my work as a physician, that's, that's how I interface with both health in general and also health as it relates to the diagnosis and treatment of cancer and then living with cancer throughout life. Okay, great. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about sort of what happened when you got that diagnosis? You've been practicing medicine for a long time and you obviously had a very busy career and you have a family. How did you navigate that um, as a physician and as a mom? So I was 43 when I was diagnosed. And for me, as for basically any everyone, I have never met anyone who was diagnosed with cancer and said, oh, oh yeah, that was pretty routine, like no big deal. Like I've never met anybody that, that had that reaction. Um, it, it just brought my regular life to a grinding halt. Um, I, I think, so in my case, I had had other biopsies before. So the biopsy process actually was routine, which is not everyone's experience, but I had already had several biopsies, which had been 
benign. I'd, I'd had to have some procedures before actually lumpectomies, but I knew beforehand that it was benign. So that process actually had become a little bit routine for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet when I had something that turned out to be malignant, you know, hearing that I have cancer was still a complete shock. So for me, um, which is not the case for everybody, I had to put my work life on hold um, and go into a very intense treatment regimen. So some types of cancer that's, that's necessary depending on what you need to do, what type of chemo or other medical therapy, um, uh, radiation, so, you know, for, for some people they have to do bone marrow transplants, I did not. Um, so it was just a complete dedication to saving my life and that went on for 11 months. So I, I went on disability um, because I work, I was already working in the hospital, actually two different hospitals at the time, including a hospital where patients have very severe dangerous infections with resistant bacteria. So yeah. I, I vividly remember explaining this to my oncologist and kind of asking, well, how, you know, how am I going to do you know, this kind of work. And she kind of looked at me, raised her eyebrow, kind of like, you're not going to work. What are you like, what, what, what are you thinking? What, what planet do you think we're on here? And <laughs> that really was a reset. Like, oh, okay. We're in a, like, I'm benched. Like I, I'm not in a game here. Oh. And <laughs> that it must was, have been hard. <laughs> well, that was, it was really like, it was a reality check, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I spent the first several weeks in a complete state of just shock, survival mode, you know, making lists, trying to get things done. You go here, you go there, you have more tests. You, in my case, I had to get um, a, a, a tunneled line put in, in my chest, uh, sometimes called a porta cath. And so, um, and that's very common depending on the type of chemotherapy and the type of cancer. So just, you just kind of, you feel like you're on this conveyor belt from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. So, um, and that's even as a physician. So while I think I, I, there are advantages, I think for me, some things were not scary the way they are for other people. In other words, you roll me into an operating room. I basically know what everything is. And I know, oh, that's the circulating nurse and this is the anesthesiologist. Hey, how's it going? You know, I, I'm not it doesn't seem foreign to me. It, it's uh, a known, comfortable workplace. Um, I, I actually ele elected to take fewer anesthesia drugs because of that. I, I am fairly sensitive to medications. And so I would I, the, I had had a previous surgery and I kind of knew how I reacted to things. And so I said, hey, you know, can I not have that one? Can I just have, you know, the one? Um, I just didn't need sort of all of the layers of anti-anxiety and sedatives that they normally give people. And I think that's part of the reason because I was pretty comfortable. I didn't have a lot of anxiety about just being in the OR because yeah. um, it's like, hey, a normal day at the office, except I happen to be on the table today, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was the crazy whirlwind for me, the way it is for anybody. Um, and what about the parenting mm -hmm. side of it? Like once you kind of got the plan down of what your treatment was going to be and what you were going to have to go through, how were you able to manage um, being a mom and their needs and everything? That was, that was extremely difficult. Um, I had a lot of help. My, my husband picked up a lot of the slack friends did in our community. Um, so my kids were in elementary school at that time. I believe it was fourth and fifth grade. So um, we relied on friends to help with the carpooling. Um, I, when I could drive, because depending on how I was feeling, I could do some of the driving, but I didn't want to go into the school during when I was immunosuppressed. So when my immune system was low, the last thing I really needed to be around was a bunch of fourth graders, um, you know, strep throat, just your average cold and flu viruses. So this is pre-COVID, as yeah, everyone remembers. Yeah, so was nobody was that. wearing a mask. I yeah. mean, um, so, 
you know, I would go through the drop off line and keep my windows rolled up. I was not getting down to hug the other parents or anything. So it was, it was a weird experience. I mean, a lot of talk, in fact, on the cancer community during when COVID started was, hey, we're all prepped for COVID. We know what it's like to wear a mask, carry hand sanitizer, you know, do an elbow bump instead of hugging hello. We like, we're, we're ready. We know how to do that. And so um, it, it was hard. I, you know, when, when I was in those few days where my immune system was just super low, you know, I wasn't going out to go grocery shopping. And I remember rolling the kids uh, into a taco with their blankets so that I could give them a big full body hug, but I wouldn't be like face to face. And that was hard. I mean, they were so little. I mean, they knew why, but it was still really hard. That yeah. was like, yeah, that's uh, ouch. Because they're still yeah. so young and they don't yeah. really, you know, understand everything. Yeah. So that was yeah. really hard. Um, and thinking back to kind of, your experience of, you know, going through treatment and all these appointments and the, you know, the medicine side effects, everything you had to deal with, what, what do you think was sort of the biggest, the the thing that surprised you the most as a physician, you know, becoming a patient, what surprised you the most about that process, do you think? I have thought about that question a lot. And I think what surprised me the most about being um, sick or in my, so what's odd frequently about cancer and maybe as opposed to other diseases is that being diagnosed with a cancer that doesn't make you feel bad is very odd because you don't feel bad till you start your treatments. Now that's not always the case. Things like leukemia, you feel sick and then you get diagnosed the same as you know most other serious diseases. But anyway, so during the treatment when I was feeling so bad and debilitated and, and, then, and then even now with the aftermath, I have a lot of lingering side effects and disabilities that are from various aspects of the cancer and the treatment. And what I did not appreciate that I feel that I appreciate much better now is the degree to which an illness or or, um, condition or disability of some kind truly pervasively pervasively affects a person. So in this case, me, I'm the person. (laughs) Um, So I'll give you an example. Um, I think prior to, so, so prior to having cancer and cancer treatment, I'd had some, some health problems, um, and, and I mean, I don't mind disclosing. Uh, this whole thing is disclosure. So say migraines, okay? So I'd had some um, difficulty with migraines, but I, I, my recollection of it was that it was compartmentalized. So I would take a treatment or I would go to the doctor and I would manage it and it kind of stayed in its corner. So even if I had a terrible migraine and I was out for a day, or I was going through a period of weeks or months where it, they were a little bit worse, somehow it, it, it did not, it still didn't, in my case, I guess, uh, didn't seem to pervasively affect me too much. Now, I know that migraine, some people, it, you know, I probably had kind of moderate migraine. So migraine, I'm not trying to minimize it, absolutely can become absolutely completely debilitating and pervasive. Um, but then with my cancer treatment, it, it was so completely pervasive and debilitating and consumed all of my energy. And I just hadn't appreciated how, the way I phrase it now is it's a full-time job to keep the meat suit running. <laughs> And even though I had taken care of patients who had serious disabilities, whether they were 
missing a limb or they had some of the other ones, um, fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, heart failure, these other things that are serious chronic diseases that require daily maintenance, medication, you know, combinations of different therapies, medication, constant attention, whether it's you have to weigh yourself every day, you have to really monitor your diet, you have to take your meds, you're going to the doctor every month, you have five specialists, you know, like really, really, really constant vigilance. So even though I was one of those five doctors, I just did not comprehend how much time and mental and physical energy all of that does. So that's the pervasiveness I'm talking about. Please interrupt me because I'm totally on a monologue here. If you want to ask nope, any no, questions about my monologue. No, it's so, it's so that, that is what I just did not have a good appreciation of. I, I always thought, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a very, empathetic doctor and I'm compassionate and I, I try to listen to my patients and da, da, da. And then, and then as I was going through this, my experience, I felt, I don't even think the word humbled is a good enough word. Maybe because humbled has been kind of co-opted as like this mm, little bit of a jargony thing to say. I almost felt, I almost felt a little ashamed, which Shame is a very strong word. So I hesitate to use that one as well because I don't feel ashamed of my work as a doctor, but I felt the urge for those patients that I had taken care of over 15 years to go back. And I wish that I had just like a snippet of time to sit with them and say, oh my gosh, did I listen enough? Did I actually appreciate what you were going through? Because now in retrospect, I don't think I did. I don't think I appreciated. I know I did not appreciate what you were going through. And, you know, maybe it's like war in the sense, now I'm really going off on a tangent here. So just uh, reel me back in. <laughs> but, but I, you know, I I'm, I'm, have not been in the military. I have a sense that I don't know what it is like to go to war. I'm not going to say that I do. And now I feel like, whoa, I thought because I was a doctor, I had some sense of what those patients were going through. But now I know I did not. I did not. And so maybe I never would have. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's I mean, I'm certainly not saying everybody should have a chronic disease so they can be empathetic. No, of course not. That's ridiculous. I think people can work on their empathy and compassion and their ability to listen and understand what other people are experiencing. Like, I don't think human beings could have survived if we didn't have that ability to do that. But man, I, I really, really wished uh, it really made me think back and sort of second guess and go, oh my gosh, was I, was I empathetic enough? Was I compassionate enough? Like, yeah, it sounds like it was just I able to lift your perspective. Yeah. Was I able to lift a little bit of that burden off of that person? Cause that's my job. Like that is my actual job, you know? So that's what, that's what I feel was the greatest thing that I learned as it relates to my job as a health professional. And it, um, yeah, I think it was humbling. I mean, I, in, in a real sense, not a jargony sense of that word. And, and um, again, I don't, I'm not glad I had cancer in order to learn that. Very clear about that. But if I can learn that from the experience, then that is something good that can come out of it because I, I, I hope everybody can have a, a doctor, a nurse, or somebody who can help them and listen to them with true compassion and lighten their load. So well, that's a, that's a very positive way to think about it. So I think that's great. Um, so I'm just curious, sort of personally, and just from a perspective in general, wondering how, how did you pull this off? You you know, you've gone through cancer, the treatment, you're working, you've got a family. 
at what point did you think, hey, I'm going to write a book on top of everything else? How did you come to that decision and how did you make that happen? So, well, first of all, the, I wrote the first draft of Braving Chemo before I went back to work. So that was when I was still Recovering. completely disabled and probably bored. Well, definitely my mind was bored and, and my body was still totally dysfunctioning. And But that's great that you did it then because then it's the most fresh in your mind and your experience. It's very raw and real as opposed to like looking back, you know, a year later. So I think that's great. Yes. I, th I think, I think it was a good time to bang out that first draft for those reasons. Um, the motivation was a good friend of mine who, who really just kept nagging me to do it until I said, all right, already, I'll just do it. Just <laughs> okay. So having somebody to hold me accountable was key. So um, she is a good friend of mine. He, she lives here locally and she has a sister who was diagnosed with cancer maybe a month or two after I was and then was going through uh, some treatments like a little bit behind me. And so the three of us would have, we had some chats together because um, she doesn't live locally. The sister doesn't. So over the next maybe six months, we had emails, email threads and chats and stuff. And so then my friend said, these chats are great. They're a goldmine of information and support. And, and even though her sister was at one of the premier cancer centers in the U.S., my friend said, yeah, but this is different. This, this, these, you know, these conversations are really important. And I think other people should benefit. Oh, no, no, no. There's too many cancer books. Nobody wants to read this. You know, I mean, just go online. There's more information there than you could read. No, no, no. I think you should write it. So she just, she just kept at me. So that's, that's how it happened. Oh, okay. And then did you go through various drafts and edits and rewrites? As Yes. So the first six months I did, I did a lot of that on my own. I found some beta readers among friends and other cancer survivors locally. Um, I spent some time uh, looking for an agent, um, got some rejections or, or just cricket sounds because that's what happens these days. You don't even get a nice rejection letter, you just get nothing. Um, and then I shelved it for a while and I spent about two years just working, getting myself back together. Um, and then I went back to it and I worked on it again. And then I, I decided to publish independently. So I incorporated my own publishing company. And then I started hiring out pieces of it that I needed hired out the graphics and such. And I, um, started working with an editor and that was really, really important. Um, I, you know, I, I, I searched by that time I was plugged into the writing community and the cancer community. And so I started, I, I had resources and I got referrals and I was talking to people. So, so from then when I really got busy with it, then I ended up, once I kind of turned the heat up, it was about nine months until I was able to publish. And that, so then I published in the fall of 2019. Oh, wow. So then it went pretty quickly once you shifted into that gear. That's yeah. Yeah. So 2019 was kind of high gear for getting, getting it to, to publish the publication. And I, I, you know, it, if I had to recommend to somebody, I would not recommend going that fast, but I just really felt an urgency. And I also, it was a ton of work. And so it was very hard to have it going in addition to the kids and, and my actual job. <laughs> and so um, I'm glad I did it. And of course, nobody knew that COVID was going to come, but I'm very glad that I got it published before COVID because I mean, plenty of people published their books during COVID, but I was able to get in a few live events around the time of publication and in early January of 2020. And so that was very helpful for me um, from a marketing per perspective that I was able to do in-person events. And so uh, it just it just ended up being a very good thing. That's great. So did you have any sort of like 
tips or tricks for timing of when you would find time to work on this in addition to everything else? Or did you kind of, I just, I remember my dad um, wrote a few books and he's a psychologist. And I remember as a kid, I would wake up, you know, super early to go to school and he would have already been up for an hour. He would get it yeah. sometimes 5 a.m. and write for an hour before he had to go to work. And I always thought, oh my gosh, how do people do that? Yeah. <laughs> but he said it was yeah. the only way to get it done before the chaos of the day took over. So I'm always curious to know, um, do you have any tips like that for anyone else who might be trying to write a book? So getting up early is a very popular one. It is not mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I need a lot of sleep. And so, um, and then I need more since my cancer uh, experience. And so I would tend to write, um, well, my, my schedule has kind of two modes because I, working as a hospitalist, we work in shifts and our shifts are long shifts. We do 12s. So that's not the case with everybody. So I kind of have a week at a time where I'm I'm out of commission. My husband says, he calls it being offshore, like an <laughs> offshore oil worker, where all I do is work because I'm working 12 hour shifts, six days in a row. And I'm kind of like out before everybody gets up or while everybody's getting up, I'm leaving. Consecutive days of that? Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, so then I come home, I eat cereal, I shower, I go to bed. Like, hey, everybody alive? Great, see ya. <laughs> and so- And then you do it again the next day. Yeah. So when I'm offshore, kind of nothing else, everybody, everybody is on their own for, you know, survival. And um, I really wouldn't write during that time, except I would jot notes. And so what I found, because for me, again, as everyone it has to kind of find their own rhythm, but I was very, I, I needed to make sure that if, like some random thought or inspiration just barged into my head I had to capture it if I didn't capture it then it wouldn't come back so I tended to use the notes function on my phone or email myself so I'd either send myself an email or just write notes and they would be one sentence or a list of something and then after that my week of shifts was done then I could go back. And then the other part of my job is some administrative stuff where I'm reviewing cases and, and it's not like a full eight hours in a row of work, but it's a few hours a day and it's flexible when I do it. So then I could fit the writing in either. And I would usually do it in the morning, but not early in the morning, but like after getting up and breakfast and kids stuff and whatnot, then I would go look at notes and then go look at emails and then do a little bit of writing. Um, and I would sometimes have to trick myself, like go out to a cafe or, you know, leave the house so that I'm not, oh, let's rearrange the sock drawer, you know, that kind of thing. Because if you stay home, at least with me, I think the urge to distract oneself with not work is really, you know, or not writing, like I love to write. I mean, you're there going, Ooh, what yeah. else can I do except write? <laughs> yeah, sometimes I feel like you so. need a change of scene if you have to write, uh, you know, a longer piece. I find that uh, has helpful for me. Although I try to, I, now I try to go to the library because I found that at like Starbucks or those kind of places, everybody's either on a call or I just have the misfortune to sit down next to like somebody bringing in kids or, you know, people yeah. having like a very loud animated yeah. And so yeah, that's, that's helpful. That's a, That's good. Um, good advice. I also like to read. So I also participated in a couple of writing workshops with, um, within the cancer community. And so there's two that I can mention and writing is very therapeutic for most people. And so, um, well, actually there are three, one is called elephants and tea, and that's an organization that runs workshops for young cancer, um, patients. Um, the other one is called Wildfire. Wildfire is a young breast cancer survivor um, magazine. And um, the, the publisher of this magazine runs workshops. And I'm blanking on if the workshops have a separate name. But if you just look up Wildfire magazine, and maybe in the show notes, I don't know if we can find oh, the links to those yeah, things. I'll do that. Yeah, so description. Wildfire magazine. Um, they also have a podcast called The Burn, B-U-R-N, The Burn. 
And so those are good resources and they do writing workshops. And then the third one is um, My Breast Density, I believe. Um, she also did some writing workshops. And then the next one is survivingbreastcancer.org. They do writing workshops. So those are all super good resources for people who, not that you're gonna write a book, but you might, or you might just write for your own well-being and to see what interesting stuff pops up. Sometimes it'll be processing cancer things. Sometimes it'll just, I mean, who knows what you might write and it's fun and um, you can meet, I mean, you'll definitely meet really interesting people. Absolutely, I mean, there's no question about that, <laughs> so. That's great. Okay. Well, we'll yeah. definitely, I'll put the links, I'll get the links and put that in the, um, the show description for people. Cause I think that can be, as you said, very therapeutic and, mm -hmm. and helpful and also positive to share with other people that, you know, who may read it and learn from it. So that's good. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so one of the things I, I think the book is so interesting in a lot of different ways and very helpful in terms of everything that you cover from hair loss and what to eat, what not to do, how to schedule. Um, but I thought the piece that was very interesting and also relevant to really any chronic illness, not just cancer, was about uh, finding your mindset and how to kind of figure out what mindset works for you. Um, and I know we hear a lot about that, especially with next with uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month in October, and you hear about fighting and battling, and there's a lot of you know, debate as to how to frame that conversation and what's productive and what's not productive for patients. So um, I think your section on the cancer mindset is great. And I just, I wanted to read uh, just a section of it and then ask you to kind of tell us a little more about that. Um, so this is from the section called Finding Your Cancer Mindset. And you write, confronting cancer and going through chemo with a balance of a challenge and healing mindset required both grit and gentleness. Grit to keep me going even when I was scared or in pain and gentleness to allow for recuperation and reflection when that was what I required. Because of this balance, I could acknowledge the horror of cancer, but eventually continue to experience the beauty of living. So I love that. I just wonder if you can tell us a little more about, um, you know, how did you frame that and how do you help people walk through that and figure out what's going to work best for them. Yeah, thank you for reading that. I actually, I, I like going back and reading the book because I like saying, oh, I still agree with myself. That's very comforting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I remember, so this, this part of the book, even though I did not know at the time, of course, that I was going to write a book, came out of um, very early on after I was diagnosed, I hadn't even had kind of the next round of tests and scans and stuff. I was sitting with a good friend of mine who she actually happens to be a psychotherapist. So she's, you know, she's a really good listener. And I was just at her house, having a cup of tea, talking about, you know, I was distressed because I, I had just gotten a diagnosis like a week before. And I was having a lot of distress because I felt like, well, I was feeling very inundated with the messaging about battling cancer and fighting cancer. And I think a lot of that messaging just came from internalized messaging or, or maybe like looking through the brochures or information or I, I'm not sure exactly where it came up, but that's what was bubbling up for me. And that was causing more distress. And I remember, I can, I can visualize, I was sitting on her couch, her dog, her dogs were there. They were very sweet. Cause you know how dogs are like, if you're distressed, they'll just come up and they'll yeah, be like, oh, they know. you know, they're very, they know they're super worried yeah. about you. Right. And I told her, I said, it doesn't make sense to me. Like why, like, this is me. I have cancer, but the cancer is also from me. It is of me. It is part of me. Like it, it's still me. And I hope we can get rid of it and make it go away, but it doesn't really feel foreign. It does not feel like a foreign invader. Like that's not the sense I have of it. So when I feel, when I think about battling, that makes, that stresses me out. It does not 
feel like the mindset or, or action that I want to take, because that would feel like battling myself, which just makes no sense to me. Like I could, I could not bring up that type of, um, I just could not take up that mantle. Like it just did not work. It did not work at all. And so I was like flailing around trying to figure out what, how am I going to think about this and how am I going to feel about it? And so I was just sort of like word babbling, like just, blah, you know, free associating. And I said, I, I think I need to, to, to think about this as like healing myself as if I had a, I said, it is a sickness. So wouldn't a healing thinking about it as healing make more sense than battling? Like, where do we even come up with this? And so, um, I mean, I think I had a lot of anger in the moment because I, I remember talking to her about heart failure. I said, oh my gosh, you know, elderly people who get heart failure, that's a very serious disease. And we don't talk about battling heart failure for goodness sake. You know, I was, yeah. and she just sat there, uh -huh, uh -huh, you know, <laughs> letting me blah, 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 blah. So fast forward to, you know, say the middle of chemo. I definitely alternated though, between, I, I think, so then by then I had learned more of a balance or not a balance, but like an alternation. Because when I would go to my chemo and I had um, a wonderful group of friends and also family, my mother came and stayed with me for, um, I think about three weeks. So she could take some of the shifts of driving me to the chemo. Cause we lived um, fairly far from where I was getting my chemo. And so on the way there, I was, I would mentally prep and it really felt that that did feel like getting battle ready. Mm -hmm. It was like the night before the battle kind of thing, mental prep, sort of, I had a, like an eating and drinking schedule. I would try to like eat a bigger meal that day or that night. I was attuned to what I was, I was always attuned to what I was eating and drinking, but even more so that day. And there was just that mental prep you do either before a battle or maybe before a sport. I think if you've ever played a competitive sport, there's kind of that like getting your game face on kind of thing, like, oh, oh, oh you know, yeah. and, and so that was definitely, so then I would tap into that battle type psychology or mindset. But then, so then I would go and do the thing, you know, get hooked up to the poison, you know, do it. But then I would completely change. So then I would really try to like sink in to visualization of healing oh, okay. and visualizing. I mean, I would really, even during the chemo, then I was not about battle at all. There was not, then it was not a battle. Then it was, I would try to embrace the, the medicine. I mean, this is going to sound like very woo, but really trying to like visualize it flowing through my, well, you read the book. There are, there's lots of visualizations in there. For me, it helped. If it's not your cup of tea, well, don't read either. Just don't read that part or don't do it. Like you have to do, I think what good feels right made your brain think about something else other than just worrying and running through, you know, endless scenarios or what could happen. Like it's, it's almost like it channels your energy in a positive way, instead of letting your mind wander. And, you know, I don't know, I can't imagine because I've never been through it, but mm -hmm. that would be the one thing that would cross my yeah. mind. Like I'm kind of a warrior. So. Yeah. I think for me, it definitely did. I mean, and I think also it's a very, uh, it's a very out of control feeling. I think that being out of control is a very common experience for people with cancer because even if you don't feel like you're you're battling your body, there's a sense that your body's been hijacked or invaded or yeah, there's just this out of control like you know, you this happened to you without your consent mm -hmm. and that out of control feeling is horrible. So doing the visualizations helped me cooperate with the chemo instead of feeling resentful toward the chemo. And so at the very least, I was kind of co-opting it. And, and I think 
it gives back a little bit. Like I was choosing to co-opt it. I was choosing to imagine the medicine flowing through my veins. I was choosing, this is going to be like a little like gross and graphic, but like I was choosing to imagine the actual cancer cells like exploding and dying, which yeah, maybe that's too gory for some people, but again, I'm a doctor. So I, I deal in the, in the graphic and gory body things. Right. So for me, I was like, yeah. And maybe, and you know, maybe that is kind of a battle mindset at, at the same time, like, you know, video game, pew, 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 like, you know, there go the cancer cells exploding. And that was helpful. And then when I would get home and there would be like that, there's different phases and for everyone it's different depends on what medicine you're on and how you feel for me the first 24 hours I was high on steroids so I'd be like ah, and then I can't sleep and so I'm like talking to my brother in California at two in the morning and ah. <laughs> so and then I kind of crash for a few days and I feel terrible and I'm not really eating and I'm like force feeding myself little bits and but then I would I would listen to lots of meditations and I would just kind of walk around. I, I had chemo in the blazing Texas heat. So I could not really go out very much. I would go out really uh -oh. early in the morning for 30 minutes and then it would be like 102. So I would just, I, I would stay inside and the kids were off school. So I, I, we would, we watched a lot of movies and stuff like that inside. So, um, but it was very like, calming things and relaxing so that was I was trying to channel that healing like again I would I would imagine my body like flushing out all the toxins like flushing out all the chemo flushing out all the dead cancer cells just purging all that stuff and so visualizing that and imagining that felt very healing you know so when you a lot of people have taste dysgeusia which is that awful taste in your mouth from chemo. So after I figured out what I had to put in my water so that I could tolerate it, yeah. then I'm, I'm sipping on my strawberry water or whatever it is, flushing everything out, you know? So that was that healing mindset that uh, it's like what I hung on to, like my lifeline, basically. That's great. Yeah, and I think just those little, like even sometimes solving those little challenges, like the taste in your mouth, that can be a huge, yes. you know, once you figure out, okay, how do I alleviate this? And we, I went through yeah. that with my daughter with her autoimmune disease. One of her infusions gives her like a very severe, like metallic taste in her mouth. And then oh. she can't drink or eat anything afterward. Like, so there's one thing she will eat after that if she wants like an, a Slurpee from 7-Eleven and there's something about that mm -hmm. artificial sugary whatever she'll drink yeah. thing. so yep. it's our ritual like after infusion yes. we stop right and, so yeah and just those right. little hacks I think are super helpful for people so I love which that brings up an important point and and food somehow food gets so people become very rigid about food I think and health and I do have a food chapter in the book in Brave and Chemo. It's not very big, but honestly, I, I, I did that on purpose just because there are tons of books on food and cookbooks yeah. for chemo. I just wanted to give a taste, haha, just like a little overview. Um, and, I, and I wanted to emphasize just eating what you can in these situations is more important than obsessing about Oh, did I eat enough carbs? Did I eat enough omega three? Like you know, right now is not when you need to obsess about that. Yeah. <laughs> like we're gonna like forgive all of that stuff. Yeah, you and, can go back to that eventually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, that that I think is the most important point. You know, right after your infusion, like would I recommend people eat? You know cherry slurpees seven times a day the rest of their life no but if that's what you can eat after your infusion then you should eat that <laughs> so that's the, that's great um and i think you also do a good job of covering some of that in your blog you seem to have brought some kind of practical tips and guide you know things that people can embrace um 
I, I guess would like to ask you sort of what are some of the most common things that you heard from people when you're writing the book and then also now that you um, address on the blog so food is one um what other any kind of other like lifestyle issues or so i think with um with food uh there are a couple things that people really ask about um so the, the best way to interact with me if people want to interact with me is actually on Twitter. Um, people are welcome to drop a comment on my blog and I will find it. But um, uh, if they want to interact with me on Twitter, I'm on, I, I'm on Twitter six days a week. I don't, I don't go on Twitter on Sunday. I do a media free day. Um, I love Twitter. But, <laughs> I'm totally guilty of that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I like Twitter. I think it has a really, really healthy cancer community that does a good job of keeping healthy boundaries on its own. Yeah. And so it's a good place to find support and also pose questions. And there are many, many, many physicians and oncologists that interact with the patient advocate and patient communities. So it is, again, you're not going to, you should not be getting, this is my disclaimer, in case you haven't noticed, that you shouldn't be getting your medical advice from Twitter but it is a good place to float questions. And so I'm, I, I interact with other physicians and patients and patient advocates and survivors and everything else on Twitter. I've noticed so, that too about Twitter. I love how yeah. it's a space where physicians and patients both interact and communicate and share. And even yes. you know, some of the groups like the Breast Cancer Social Media Group was founded by a physician yes. and a patient. So yeah, I think yes. that's amazing and different than what you get on Facebook if you're in a support Absolutely. group. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you get 100%. a hundred percent. Yeah. So what I find in, in those communities is that people feel very confused about what they should eat and they do tend to get bogged down in, well, I heard dairy was bad and I should never eat dairy or I, you know, what about red meat? Red meat is bad. And, and then, and you kind of find some folks who are in the extremes of different things. Um, and so I think the answer is it depends where you are in your treatment. It depends on other aspects of your health and your body. So it depends. Um, I mean, it, it really is individualized because somebody who's 70 and somebody who's 27 are not gonna have the same health needs. Um, someone who has diabetes or doesn't are not gonna have the same health needs. I mean, so you just, uh, the answer is that um, I, I think meeting with a nutritionist who's experienced in cancer, people with cancer is gonna be helpful. Now, that being said, probably more than half of the United States does not have access to that in, in our, region, we, do, we don't have any cancer nutritionists. I mean, we, many, many parts of the country just don't have access to that unless you're near a very, very large cancer center. So, um, okay. And you touched on briefly kind of the patient education component and how that a lot of those resources are really lacking where you practice medicine. Um, yeah. I guess what uh, sort of, where do you think there's the most need um, aside from diet? in terms of patient education when it comes to cancer? In my opinion, and this is based on my patient population in my area and the patients that I see, I believe that it's for anticipation of um, side effects from their treatments. So basically what to expect now, all oncologists and, and surgeons, they do do this. So I'm not trying to imply that they're not doing this at all. I just think that uh, because everybody gets some sort of pamphlet or handout, um, usually gets, um, patients almost always get a session with the nurses. It's just that patients need more. Everybody's in shock and overwhelm when they're diagnosed. And so then when they, by the time they have their procedure, they forgot what was discussed at their session. Or let's say your chemotherapy is six months long. That one session you had was four months ago. Yeah. Um, and 
because usually maybe the pamphlet you get is one page or one trifle. Again, it's, it's, it's a good trifold of information and it's meant to be simple which is good because you can't, you can't hand the patient a book that's, it's, it's too overwhelmed, like a, a fat book, right? Mm -hmm. So I think, and there's actually good research on this. There needs to be a better communication loop of who do I ask questions to? How can I get more information? Um, and some offices are more efficient than others. Like in other words, there's a separate phone number for patients in active treatment, as opposed to the patients who are not in active treatment and have a question. There's sort of a bit of a triage in terms of the urgency of needing to talk to a nurse, say, about their symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so so that, that's what I see, because I, I would say the number one reason I see patients in the hospital is that they're dehydrated. If, if you just look at chemotherapy, they're dehydrated from nausea and vomiting or just unable to eat from their nausea or their mouth sores. And then they just, they kind of deteriorate and they can't, they can't get ahead of it. And then they're admitted to the hospital and they mo almost all of them do fabulous. They get IV fluids and are there for just a couple of days and then they can go back home and continue their treatment. But that's, that's where I see the biggest need is. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought about the um, the dehydration, but that sounds like a, mm -hmm. a huge problem, especially if they've been nauseous or vomiting or mm -hmm. you know unable to eat and stuff. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's a big problem. Um, yeah, well, the patient education is something that we're um, very involved in, but in the clinical trial space. So we have, you know, our patient navigators who we offer this as a free service for patients and physicians, and they. Um, they speak 10 different languages and they will explain, you know, what, how a clinical trial works, what, you know, how do you enroll, what are the eligibility criteria, all of that in, you know, sort of a layman's way, but also in a medically accurate way. And also in a way that patients have time to ask questions. So if you get on a, you know, 20 minute video call with a patient navigator and you can take your time and, and ask what you need to ask. And then the patient can go to their physician and discuss all of the clinical trials that may be available to them and have, you know, kind of a more informed discussion. So there's, so I think there's a lot of, a um, lot of need and a lot of work to be done in that area for sure, whether it's diet or clinical trials or treatment or whatever it might be. Um, okay. Let's see. What else did we want to ask you about? I guess the, the big, the question I did not ask is where can people buy your book? Because um, <laughs> I have my copy here, which I got on Amazon, but where, um, where can people find it? So uh, all of the online booksellers have it. My personal favorite is bookshop.org because this is a nonprofit that supports independent bookstores. Oh, cool. um, so uh, they run, they do charge shipping, but their prices are price matched and they frequently run, have coupons and sales and they also have um, free shipping days and things like that. So um, you can kind of keep your eye out for that if you really don't want to pay shipping. Um, and you can also link it to your own local bookstore if you want to specifically direct your purchases to your local bookstore and make your donations go there. Um, you don't have to though. You can just generically donate to the whole world. Um, but of course, uh, Amazon does. And then everybody else, Walmart, Target, Barnes and Noble, all of those places where you can order anything, anywhere you can order online can stock the, can stock, uh, the book. Um, some of the other bookstores as well, Powell's, um, uh, IndieBound, some of the ones that if you're a real reader, you'll know those. Um, most people don't have never heard of them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then um, my hospital, both the gift shops have them. So some hospitals may be stocking it in the gift shop. And then um, some oncologists are also stocking it in the gift shop. So for example, in San Antonio, the Start Center has a gift shop and, and they sell it there for their patients. Just they have a little pharmacy. They also sell um, over-the-counter medications and other supplies that people need for their treatment. They sell a few books there like um, Anti-Cancer, A New Way of Life they sell. They sell Braving Chemo and a few other books that are related to cancer support. So I'm hoping that more and more 
oncology centers will have the book. And I, and I also wanted to mention one other program. So um, I have a book donation program and that is in partnership with cancer centers and oncologists that want to be able to give the book to patients for free. So oh, um, yeah, so my publishing company is not a nonprofit. Uh, so you can't get a tax write-off, but we do have a Venmo set up that's connected to my, my publishing company so that people can uh, make a contribution to the publishing company. And then I use that to, to purchase and send copies of Braving Chemo to cancer centers and oncologists that want to then give the book away to patients who maybe can't afford resources because cancer is super expensive. And so I just want to make it available to as many people as possible. So we have that going as well. That's great. That's a great idea. Okay. Well, we'll be sure and put the links to yeah. your website and the blog and everything um, in the description on, on YouTube. Um, and also we'll share it on social media because we both admitted that we love Twitter. So we'll have to That's right. do this on Twitter. Um, yep. All yeah. right. Is there anything else that I didn't ask you about that you wanted to mention? Not particularly, I just, I really appreciate what organizations like yours, like My Tomorrows are doing. Um, all of us in the cancer community are so, so thankful for all of the support. Thank you so much for sharing your book with us and your experience. Uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you also to our listeners. Um, please tune in again next time. Mm -hmm.